Come on, guys, help me out. Cause we'll be the friendship and affection I need. The fear my father smiling on me. Gave me in your love is all I've ever needed. Yours will be the only name that matters to me, the only one whose favor I see, the only name that matters to me. Yours will be the friendship and affection I need to feel my father smile. Yours is the name, the name that saves me. Mercy and grace and the power that forgave me. And your love is all I've ever needed. And yours is the name, the name that saves me. Mercy and grace and the power that forgave me. And your love is all I've ever needed. What's that name? warm-up does for you? <laughs> uh, work for us, too. I love this little section over here. It's pretty cool. So, um, as you can tell, we're uh, looking at missions this month. I know you, some of you are filling out your sheets, and I'd appreciate it if you didn't do that during the songs. However, during the sermon, John might let you wander around. <laughs> I'm just kidding, John. <laughs> So as we're talking about missions, I just kind of want to bring up that missions don't necessarily mean going to the ends of the earth. Missions, um, you can be part of the mission field with support, with prayer. In fact, there is a mission field 
right here, right here, <laughs> right, right here. And um, uh, I want to read a song to, or uh, read a, a verse to you. But uh, first, has anybody seen the movie Big Fish? Okay. I've wanted to use this analogy for so long. And um, I love that movie. It's like, it's probably my all-time favorite and because it makes me cry every time. And um, the character in it, Edward Bloom, at one point in, this, in the movie, he looks into a glass eye and he can see how he's going to die. Okay. So he sees how he's going to die. He knows what's going to happen. He, so it kind of made him embrace life and just go and do things. He was helping people, all this stuff. And people are like, aren't you afraid? He goes, this isn't how I'm going to die. So he would just do it. And I'm thinking, if we could take a little bit of that with us. I mean, we know in, um, in Psalm 1611, it says, in your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. I mean, I know that, that right now, we, we don't know how we're going to die. But if you put that illustration into your life, you know what's going to happen when you die. So uh, my advice to you is to go out and do it. And let's sing a little, little song about that. Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. I will follow. All your ways are good, all your ways are sure. I will trust in you alone, higher than my sight, high above my life. I will trust in you alone. Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. Into the world, light into my life. I will live for you alone. You're the one I see, knowing I will find all I need in you alone. In you alone, yeah. Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move.
heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like, but I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night. You call me that you're pleased and that I never heard. You're a good, good father It's who you are It's who you are It's who you are And I'm loved by you It's who I am It's who I am It's who I am I Searching for answers far and wide, but I know we're all searching for answers. Only you provide, cause you know just what we need before we say our word. You're a good It's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all. Always, you are perfect in all of your ways. To us, you are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your.
Will you pray with me this morning? Heavenly Father, I sometimes don't know what else we can say to uh, to thank you for who you are, but thank you for who you are and what you've done. Lord, thank you for uh, making us who we are. Lord, that through you we are joint heirs with Jesus. Lord, that we are a family and uh, Lord, one day, when the trumpet calls, we will all be gathering together around Jesus' feet, worshiping, casting our crowns down, Lord, and just basking in your love. Lord, we long for that day. Lord, we ask that as we live our life that we, that we, uh, we keep your joy, we keep your love inside of us, Lord. Lord, that we push it out and share it with people, Lord, and that through our actions, through our words, they uh, might want to know who you are. Lord, we have this great gift that you've given us. And what a disservice not to share it. As we do that every day, in Jesus' name. called me from the grave by name You called me out of all my shame I see the old has passed away The new has come Now I
Please be seated. Let's give him a big round of applause. That was awesome. Thank you, worship team. You guys are great. Thanks for heading it up, Billy. You're awesome. <clears throat> I didn't hear that. Um, good morning, everyone. I said you're awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, all those that are home watching us. Hello. Good to see we have another good crowd this morning, and we're happy about that. We, we uh, pray God blesses each and every one of us. Uh, this morning, uh, it's going to be kind of different. Uh, Brother Bill over here, he's had some health issues, and he's no longer going to be able to come up and do uh, communion messages for us. So I'm taking <clears throat> my turn this week and next week for Bill. It was his turn. And then we'll get back on a regular rotation after that. Um, but this morning, I want to dedicate uh, this communion message to Bill. Uh, Bill wrote this. He wrote the one I'm going to do next week, which is going to be about St. Patrick's Day. So can you imagine a communion service about St. Patrick's Day? <clears throat> so that will be exciting. And this uh, message this morning, Bill actually shared with us at men's breakfast one morning. And I just liked it so much, he gave me a copy of it. And so I stole it from him. And so I asked him if I could do it this morning. And he graciously uh, is allowing me. It's called the, <clears throat> the Silent Sermon. A member of a certain church who previously had been attending services regularly stopped coming. After a few weeks, a pastor decided to go visit him. It was a chilly evening. The pastor found a man at home alone, sitting before a blazing fire, Guessing the reason for his pastor's visit, the man welcomed him in, led him to a comfortable chair near the, near the fireplace, and waited. And waited. The pastor made himself at home, but said nothing. In the grave silence, they contemplated the dance of the flames around the burning logs. After some minutes, the pastor took the fire tongs, carefully picked out a brightly burning amber, and placed it on the side of the hearth, all alone. Then he sat back in his chair, still silent. The host watched all this in quiet contemplation as the one lone ember's flame flickered and diminished. There was a momentary glow, and then his fire was no more. Soon it was cold and dead. Not a word had been spoken since the initial greeting. The pastor glanced at his watch and realized it was time to leave. He slowly stood up, picked up the cold, dead ember, placed it back in the middle of the fire. Immediately, it began to glow once more with the light and warmth of the burning coals around it. As the pastor reached the door, to leave, his host said with a tear running down his cheek, thank you so much for your visit and especially for the fiery sermon. <laughs> I will be back in church next Sunday. We live in a world today which tries to say too much with too little. Consequently, few listen Sometimes the best sermons are left unspoken. Remember that Christ is what keeps us alive, and without him, we will wither and die. What we have in our lives is not important, or who we have in our lives it's, is, is not as important as who we have in our lives, and that is Christ our Lord. 
This is from King James Version, Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. That's a relationship. I shall not want. That's supply. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. That's rest. He leadeth me beside still waters. That's refreshment. He restoreth my soul. That's healing. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness. That's guidance. For his name's sake. That's purpose. Yeah, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. That's testing. I will fear no evil. That's protection. For thou art with me. That's faithfulness. The rod of thy staff comfort me. That's discipline. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. That's hope. Thou anointest my head with oil. That's consecration. My cup runneth over. That's abundance. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. That's blessing. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord. That's security. Forever. That's eternity. What is most valuable is not what we have in our lives, but whom we have in our lives. Let's pray. Holy Father, God in heaven, in Jesus' name, we, we pray and give you all the glory, and we thank you for blessing us with uh, you, Holy Father, you, Jesus Christ, you, Holy Spirit, and we pray and give thanks for all these wonderful people here today, Holy Father. We, play, we pray as we come to the table to partake of the memory of your sacrifice on the cross, Jesus, that you bless each and every one of us, and we come to you with open minds, open hearts, to have our souls cleansed. In Jesus' name, amen. The tithing tray is in the back by the foyer door, and those at home, uh, I think you know that online is a place you can send your tithes, your prayers, your prayer requests, uh, all kinds of good stuff like that. So let's pray for the offering this morning. 
Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you that we can always trust in you. You are an abundant God, and out of your great mercy, you have given us so much. We give you this offering today. With it, we worship you and give our whole selves to you. Please now take it and use it for your kingdom and your glory. Extend and multiply its reach and influence, we pray. May it be a great blessing to many. We ask all this in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Good morning. Well, my name is Sally Rackley. As a member of the mission committee, I'm impressed with this committee at this church, which as a body donates 10% of their total offerings to support missions. While I wasn't called to serve in a faraway land, I am called to be a missionary here in this community. So today I want to share a brief look at two of the missions we support right here in Lake Havasu City. KNLB Radio is a local station that is Christian-based. They offer a variety of programs, including music and teaching broadcasts. The station was founded by Pastor Richard Tatham and began operation here in Lake Havasu in July of 1983. It is completely funded through the support of listeners. Their mission, Your Celebration Radio Network, is a Christ-centered ministry committed to sharing the good news through music and programming. We provide programming that strengthens families and encourages believers in their Christian walk. The next one is Pregnancy Care. Pregnancy Care is a nonprofit Christian ministry, and services are provided at no cost to their clients. They offer online Earn While You Learn classes through the Bright Courses program to help women, especially, although men can take it too, to take care of themselves, if you will. They also can provide diapers and wipes to those in need. They do have an update. Donations can now be given from their website, which is lakehavasupregnancycare.com. Their mission, our mission, is to offer teens and women who are single or married hope, help, and information before and after pregnancy. Thank you. If you were paying attention, several of the answers on that sheet you have are now a little closer to being reality. Uh, thank you, Sally, for that. And uh, I want you all to know, we have some overachievers around church. I already have one that's done. And uh, you've received your prize, huh? Yes. So uh, anyway, <laughs> since it's missions month, guess what? I'm going to take a break from Luke. Oh, darn. I know. Although we're getting close, folks, it's almost, we're almost through the book of Luke, but we're going to take the next four, this week and the next three weeks and delve in a little bit to missions. And today we are going to look at the idea, why do we send missionaries and why do we support missionaries? Here's the answer. It's biblical. Okay, well, you know, the, the uh, meditation that Bill did that Mark filled in, uh, basically said we should be quiet now, so I guess I'm done. <laughs> now, uh, <laughs> I don't think I could have stared at the fire and not said anything. That would have been impossible for me. But we are going to answer that question a little more fully. It is biblical. And to see that, we're going to turn to Matthew chapter 28, verse 16 through 20. What has very often been called the Great Commission, it's also been called the Church's Marching Orders. Um, Jesus gave his disciples a job to do. And again, in Matthew 28, 16 and following, we're going to read that. But the 11 disciples, that's because Judas had gone out and hung himself, remember? So the 11 disciples proceeded to Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had designated. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some were doubtful. And Jesus came up and spoke to them and said, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son 
and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now, as we look at that, we see that the disciples, the 11 at this point, are given a job to do. And that job, singular, not job plural, but that job singular was something Jesus commanded them to do. They certainly did other things, but their one true job was laid out right here. Now, Jesus had the authority to give them the job, didn't he? He says, all authority has been given to me in heaven on honor and on earth. Jesus has been given full authority by the Father to give these orders. And what's he telling them to do? He says to go, to go to all the nations, to go to all the nations. Now, that's a big job for 11 guys, huh? Let's pick out 11 people. If you, well, I'll tell you what. I'll go to every nation on earth if you buy the plane tickets. I won't be able to stay anywhere very long because there's a lot of them. But he says for these 11 guys to go to all the nations. And he tells them when they go there to make disciples. Now, disciple is a church word. How many of you all have ever used that at work? I want you to be my disciple. Probably not, unless you were in a, working in a cult. Um, but, but, but what it means is you want to be a mentor to somebody else. You want to teach them something. You want them to follow you and learn. That's what a disciple is. It's somebody who follows and learns. But a disciple hasn't made the big commitment. Jesus had lots of disciples. He had around 120 feet people that followed him around from here to there to here to there. But it was a bigger group some days and a smaller group other days. Some of them came and went. Some stuck with him. Others did not. Some of them became these apostles. Again, that's a church word. That just means somebody that got sent. Jesus gave them their marching orders. He sent them right at this point. He says, go, and here's what you're going to do. You go out and make disciples, but then you take it one step further. A disciple hasn't put it all on the line yet. But he says, once they become disciples, once you teach them something, you baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That word baptize, I really don't like at all. I'm a southern Missouri boy. I grew up in the Ozark Mountains. We don't baptize people. We dunk them. That's what that word literally means. If you were a teenager and went to the pool and you snuck up behind people and dunked them underwater, that's the same exact word right here. If you wash dishes and you put a pot in the sink and it goes all the way under, That's what this word, when you look at the bottom of your blender and it says, do not immerse in water, that would be a scary thing, huh? (laughs) You know, why is this, that's that same word, to put under the water, to baptize, to immerse. That's what that word means. That's what it always meant. But then you had some folks who didn't want to hurt anybody's feelings or make them mad. And they said, well, instead of saying dunk, or a churchier word like immerse, let's just take the word baptizo out of the Greek and then we'll just turn it into an English word and then you can call it whatever you want. You can say it's whatever you want. But if you really look at the word, it means to put under, to immerse in something. Now, We are to do that in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And that's making a commitment to all three parts of God. It's a commitment to the Father. It's a commitment to the Son. It's a commitment to the Holy Spirit. Why did Jesus say to do this, though? Well, it's a reenactment. Uh, It's a reenactment of a burial and a resurrection. Just like Jesus was buried, 
and rose again. We are buried in the water. And we rise to walk in the new life. The old me was buried in the water and the new me came up out of the water. That's pretty cool. <laughs> I want to read from Romans chapter 6. It's kind of funny. We were there in Sunday school this morning as well. Um, Paul and I didn't plan that. I guess that must have been God doing it. Romans 6, 1 through 11, it says this. What should we say then? Are we to continue in sin though that, so that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we've been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in a newness of life. For if we become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died is freed from sin. Now, if we've died in Christ, with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Death no longer is master over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Baptism is all about submission. It's a reenactment, but there's more to it. It's about submission. There's nothing you have to do to be baptized except allow somebody to do it. There's nothing you have to do to be immersed, but to allow someone to do it. Quite a few years ago, Stephen had just, he was 15. I know that because he was driving with a learner's permit. We went on a vacation. And uh, we went up north. We wound up going clear up to Canada and back. It was an awesome trip. Robin let me just drive, and we didn't have any um, places we had to be. Oh, so cool. Oh, refreshing. It was so nice. But anyway, we stopped at a place and uh, camped out for the night by a lake. And uh, my son Stephen, who was 15 and thought he was pretty tough, decided it was about time to prove to the old man that he could put him underwater. And how long did we go, Robin? 20 minutes, probably? I dunked him somewhere around 40 or 50 times, and he never once got me because I would not submit. And you know, there are some benefits to having a low center of gravity. <laughs> He's taller than me. It was easy to put him down. But he couldn't get me because I wouldn't let him do it. And you know, there are people who just won't, allow themselves to be immersed for whatever reason. But you know what? Jesus said, if we're going to make people disciples, we've got to take them to the next step. And that's being immersed. To do what Jesus said to do. Now, Jesus also Told us, told us some other things. He said, you also have to allow, you have to also have to continue to teach them. We don't just leave somebody drip drying on the baptistry and say, oh, it's all done. No, that's where the rubber hits the road. That's when you make that commitment, and it's kind of like you don't get married and then say, well, we're done, see you later. <laughs> well, maybe some people do, but I didn't. I liked having my wife around. Uh, <laughs> That's why I married her. I wanted her around, you know. And, and so we didn't just say, well, we're married now. See you in a few years. No. That was the beginning of being married, of being together, to be, to be a couple. I mean, we'd been a couple, but it was different now. And that was the beginning point. Jesus 
said, continue to teach them. And that's what we have to do. That's the beginning. You learn enough to become a follower. It's like being a baby. You know, how many of you ladies had a baby and then said, well, they'll grow up eventually. See you later. <laughs> how would that work? You know? Well, you'd have a mess, wouldn't you? And a lot of other problems. CPS would get called. There'd be all kinds of irrit terrible problems. No, Babies have to be nurtured. They have to be taught. They have to be raised. And not just by their moms. Guys, we're not off the hook either, right? We had our part. Amen, sister. You bet. Yeah, I heard that one from clear up here. Yeah, it's not just the women's job to, to raise their kids. God gave kids a mom and dad because we bring different things to the table. Who, who does a mom, who does a kid go to when they have a boo-boo? Usually mom, right? As, Dad says in the famous words of my uh, son's football coach, rub a little dirt on it. It's a long way from your heart. <laughs> and kids need both, don't they? They need somebody to go, oh, honey, I'm so sorry you hurt yourself. Here, let me get a Band-Aid, you know. But they also need somebody to say, hey, suck it up, buttercup. You know, they need, they need the influence of both, a man and a woman. And, and we need to give them that. And it's the same thing in the church. You're born as a new baby Christian, and just like the uh, moment of silence we talked about here with the fire and the coal, we don't just become a Christian and then go off by ourselves. We become a Christian, and we're part of the fire, and we need those flames around us. We need that warmth around us. We need that nurturing, that teaching to fan the flame. And so we are to teach them to observe all that I commanded you. And that word observe doesn't mean stand back and watch. That's how we use it sometimes. But in this context, that word observe means to do what I say. We observe, like for instance, we observe a holiday. That means we celebrate that holiday. It doesn't mean we stand back and watch the holiday. We participate in it. And that's what the word means here. It means to participate. It means to do. And Jesus said, Observe, teach them to do what I told you they need to do. And then he says, I'll be with you. In another place in Scripture, Jesus told his disciples, I have to leave so the Holy Spirit, the Helper, can come. And if you have given your life to Jesus, you've... You, you believe who he is. You confess him before others. You're buried with him in Christian baptism. You rise to walk in that new life. The Holy Spirit is a part of that new life. He lives inside of us. He guides our conscience. He works in our lives. He's there. And so through the Holy Spirit, Jesus was with his disciples all the way. But he did more than that. He tells them how to do it. In Acts chapter 1, verse 18, we see the same event told from a different angle. You know, if, uh, if uh, we were all standing outside after church and we were this, and we looked and there was a wreck out here, and the cops came by and said, what'd you see? Well, I might say, well, I saw a 67 Corvette, and it was so pretty, and then it wasn't pretty anymore because it got crushed. Somebody else might say, well, uh, I, I heard this loud noise, and you know, we'd all have different perceptions of what happened. And we'd all tell bits and parts of the same story, but we wouldn't any of us probably tell all of it because we see things from different points of view. Well, when, when Luke wrote the book of Acts, he, he talked to people, and here's what he wrote about that day. Acts chapter 1, verse 8 through 11 but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest parts of the earth. And after he said these things, he was lifted up while they were looking on and a cloud received him out of their sight. And as they were gazing intently into the sky while he was going, behold, two men in white clothing stood beside them they also said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus who has been taken up into heaven will come in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. Now I always crack up a little bit on the inside when I read this because 
These, these disciples see one of the most amazing things that anybody's ever seen in their life. Jesus gives them his speech here, and then there he goes. And he disappears into a cloud. He went up, a, you know, clouds don't hang down here. They're way, you know, he went a long way, and they're watching this whole thing. And he disappears into the cloud, and they're still trying to see him. And all of a sudden, they look, and there's these two shiny guys, angels, standing there saying, what are you guys looking at? Well, uh, uh, Jesus in the cloud? That's what we're, well, he's going to come back the same way, so knock it off. And really what they're saying is get busy. Jesus told you what to do. Go do it. Get back to Jerusalem. Wait for the Holy Spirit to come. And then, boy, you are going to be so busy. And that's exactly what happened. They were to expect the power of the Holy Spirit to come and to work through it and through them. And, boy, he sure did. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem right there. Judea, Samaria, and everywhere else, he tells them. And they were to do their best to carry this mission as far and as close as they could. It was mentioned this morning that missionaries aren't all far away. That missions also involves being right here. And that is so, so true. And so Jesus sent somebody to remind him to get busy. He sends these two angels. You've got a job to do. And they did it. I want to read something for you. I stole it from, well, I didn't steal it. I copied it. It's still there. At Christianity.com. I asked the question, how did the apostles die? And here's what it says. Reports and legends abound that they are, not, they are not always reliable, but it's safe to say that the apostles went far and wide as heralds of the message of the risen Christ. An early legend says that they cast lots and divided up the world to determine who would go where so they could hear about Jesus. Now, doesn't that make you smile a little bit? Now think about this. They, they put a map up on it. We got a map right there. They put this map up of what they know of the world and they say, okay, let's throw the dice, and whoever gets the high score gets to pick first. And, and oh, I, I want to go over there. That looks promising. Oh, I'll go over here. I'll go over there. I'll go over here. And I'll read a little more here. It says, they suffered greatly for their faith, and in most cases met violent death on account of their bold witness. Here's how some of the apostles are believed. And remember, this is tradition. This isn't in the scripture, so we don't really know. But it's believed, here we go, Peter and Paul, both martyred in Rome somewhere around 66 AD during the persecution under Emperor Nero. Paul was beheaded, Peter was crucified, upside down, at his request, since he said he did not feel he was worthy to die in the same manner as his Lord. Andrew, he went to the, quote, land of the man-eaters in what is now the Soviet Union. I'm not going to touch that with a 10-foot pole. Um, Christians there claim him to be the first to bring the gospel to their land. He also preached in Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey, and in Greece, where he was said to have been crucified. Thomas, probably the most active in the area east of Syria. Tradition has him preaching as far east as India, where the ancient Martha Roma Christians revere him as their founder. They claim he died there when pierced through with the spears of four soldiers. Philip possibly had a powerful ministry in Carthage in North Africa and then went to Asia Minor where he converted the wife of the Roman proconsul. In retaliation, the proconsul had Philip arrested and cruelly put to death. Matthew. The tax collector, writer of the Gospel, Matthew, ministered in Persia and Ethiopia. Some of the oldest reports say he was not martyred, while others say he was stabbed to death in Ethiopia. Bartholomew had widespread missionary travels attributed to him by tradition to India with Thomas, back to Armenia and also to Ethiopia and southern Arabia. 
There are various accounts of how he met his death as a martyr for the gospel. James, the son of Alphaeus, one of the le- of at least three James is referred to in the New Testament. There's some confusion as to which is which, but this James is believed to have ministered in Syria. The Jewish historian Josephus reports that he was stoned and then clubbed to death. Simon the Zealot, the story goes that he ministered in Persia, was killed after refusing to sacrifice to the sun god. Matthias, who was the apostle that was chosen to become the 12th, the, 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 the replacement for Judas, uh, tradition has him in Syria with Andrew and dying by a death of burning. John, the only one of the apostles generally thought to have died a natural death from old age. He was leader of the church in Ephesus area and in, was also take, took care of Mary, the mother of Jesus, in his home. During Domitian's persecution in the middle 90s, he was exiled to the island of Patmos. There he is credited with writing the last book of the New Testament, the Revelation. An early Latin tradition has him escaping unhurt after being thrown into a boiling pot of oil in Rome. Wow. These men devoted their lives to sharing the gospel, to spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. And these were pretty ordinary guys. They were pretty much regular fellas. But with the the power of God, Anything God wants you to do is possible. They spread the message of Christ to all of the Roman world and even beyond that. Rome itself had enough Christians for for Nero when he burned a big chunk of the city because he wanted to do urban renewal. He blamed the Christians. And there were enough of them to make it plausible. And that's well before 100 A.D., Christians were there in numbers. These 11 and then 12 men took their marching orders seriously. Jesus said to go, they went. He said to make disciples, they made disciples. He said to baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and they, and they, they did. He said keep teaching them, and they did. And they relied on the fact that Jesus, through the power of the Holy Spirit, was going to be with them always. So we've started March Missions Madness. What do we take home with us? Several things. First of all, the job of the apostles has become the job of the church. In Acts chapter 8, verse 3 and 4, it says, Saul began ravaging the church, entering house after house, dragging off men and women, and he would put them in prison. Therefore, those who had been scattered went about preaching the word. They didn't just hide. God took this terrible tragedy. uh, Stephen, one of the first deacons, was murdered. He was stoned to death because people didn't like what he was saying and they couldn't argue with it. And that started a wave of persecution in Jerusalem that drove many people out. But where they went, they didn't go hide. They went somewhere else, and they started telling other people about Jesus. And so what what really happened was they threw water on a grease fire. And instead of having a little grease fire, now it's all over the kitchen. Those people went, and they told others. And the church, through this tragedy, grew. And maybe we ought to look for God to do that in our lives as well. You know, there are times as individuals where terrible things happen to us. We need to look for the good that God is putting there for us to be able to serve his kingdom, to go and to share, to reach out. The the apostles also suffered greatly to carry out their mission. And we may have to suffer to do what God wants us to do as well. At the very least, we may have to step out of our comfort zone a little bit. I would dare say that going to India 
probably was out of Bartholomew's comfort zone, wouldn't you? Um, going to a completely foreign place. This born and raised Jewish boy goes to India? Wow. Comfort zone, it's way back there. <laughs> We may have to do that, folks. We may suffer to do what God wants us to do. We may have to walk away from something that we really like because God gets a hold of us. I'll tell another story on my son, Stephen. When he went to Bible college, he went to Bible college because he knew his mom and I wanted him to. Robin had been pounded into the kids' heads since they were little. You need to do at least a year of Bible college to get your head screwed on straight. And so reluctantly, he went to Bible college, and he was going to be there a year, and then he was going to go somewhere and learn sound engineering, and he was going to make hit records for other people. That was his big plan. He was going to have a career in the music industry. And you know what? God got a hold of him in that year. He called me one day and said, you know, Dad, I think I'm going to become a youth minister. And I'm like, I didn't do anything out loud because... Uh, you know, we'd been praying, God, get a hold of this boy. He's got a lot to offer. And, and, and it was like, yes! <laughs> well, that's nice, Stephen. When did you come to that decision? You know. <laughs> and then God worked on him a little more, and he's a missionary in Ireland. And you know what? He gave up the dream of being a music guy. But not really. If you pull up their church service online, you probably will see Stephen playing the guitar and leading the music. If you don't, you'll see a young woman instead that's playing the guitar. Guess who taught her how to play? Mm hmm Yeah. And, uh, you know, he is still using music in a powerful way. He's written a lot of songs. We sing one of them here at church every once in a while. He's done gobs of songs to help kids remember um, you know, Scripture. He's written a bunch of them. They're just catchy little tunes that are set to Scripture, or Scripture set to them. He uses the music he gave up on a daily basis, so he didn't really ever give it up. God just said, here's a better way to use it. Now, God may say, hey, step out of your comfort zone. This isn't going to be the way you think it ought to be. We'll use it differently. Now, we also, we may be called to Jerusalem or Samaria or Judea or the uttermost parts of the earth. And what I mean by that, Jerusalem's just right here at home. We heard about a couple of the missions that we support this morning from Sally that we support that are right here in our zip code. Well, one of our zip codes. Um, we have four. But anyway... It's right here. You could drive over there and see what's going on. You could drive over there and help with what's going on. But then there's some missions that are further out. We're going to talk about some of those later this month, too, that aren't far, far, far away, but are still not right here in town. That's Judea and Samaria. And then the uttermost parts of the earth are exactly that. We have a couple of missions that are very far away. One of them is Stephen and Alyssa in Ireland. There's also the mission that we support in South Sudan. Some amazing things have happened there in the time that we've been here and before. It is a fabulous, amazing adventure that they are on. And we're a part of that. God said, go to all these different places and he said to rely on the power of the Holy Spirit to do it. If we rely on our own power, not much is going to get done. But when we rely on God's power, it's limitless what can happen. So if you're a Christian, you are God's witness. Just like those apostles, so are you. And I want to challenge you today to act like it to be that witness. Dead to sin, alive to God. Live that way. And in the next three weeks, we'll continue talking about how we can help do what God wants to do
through us. Again, it's not what I want to do or what you want to do or what somebody else thinks we ought to do. It's what God wants done through us. Now, we have a decision song we're going to sing in just a second. And we're going to be challenging you all month to be a missionary. Maybe not in Ethiopia or somewhere far away. It might be right here at home. But to really, truly say, God, it's up to you what I do. It's not up to me. It's up to you. You decide where, what, when, and how, and I'll do it. Now, if you have a decision to make today, you may want to say, hey, oh, why not? I'll go to Kenya. If you want to do that, great. We're all for it. You may, though, have to say, you know, I haven't really ever totally given in to God. I'm not ready to be a missionary because I haven't really said, Lord, you're in charge yet. If that's where you're at today, don't be there tomorrow. We're going to sing. Mark, can you come up and be up front here? I want to help play this song. And uh, if you have a decision to make, make it. Let's stand together.
Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you for this great day to worship you. And Lord, I pray that as we've worshiped you today, we've truly made the decision to put you number one in our lives, to put you above everything, every body, every desire. Help us, Lord, to be your witnesses in this world, whether it's right here in Havasu or whether it's halfway around the world. And Lord, as we do that, Help us to be the men and women that you want us to be. We pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen.